Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Thursday Virtual Thursday. Thir yeah, that's good. We're off to a good start. Virtual Thursday's Dire Literary Series. And tonight, um, our guest is Jane Roper, whose wonderful book, Society of Shame, is right here. And uh, we we're going to uh, give her a full introduction if I didn't, uh, didn't mess up. Oh, wonderful. All right, well, let's give a full introduction to Jane because um, uh, Jane is, I just, off to her. Jane, uh, Jane and I have known each other for years and years, and uh, she has written a memoir called Double, Town, Double Time, a novel, Eden Lake, and her new book, Society of Shame, is out right now, and uh, Jane's been working her butt off, touring it all all up and down and doing plenty of readings. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Jane right now. Okay. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's a delight. I know we have known each other for a very long time, haven't we? Um, yeah, since back in the day, I think I did a reading for uh, for uh, Eden Lake, uh, maybe even when you were doing the in-person series. So, yeah, 2003, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that would have been later. I don't, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, but I'm psyched to be here. Um, what do you want me to just blab about my book for a little bit? Um, actually, uh, I was expecting you to read a little bit from it, but yep. we can we can blab. I never leave my guests blabbing on their own. That's really no. I'm happy. I will. I I have a passage to read, so <laughs> I will happily do that. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to, I'll just read a bit from the beginning because that's the easiest. Um, and what you need to know is that this book is about 47 year old uh, Kathleen Held. She is a mother, uh, a wife of an aspiring uh, Senate candidate. Um, he's a very up and coming politician. She's also a copy editor and a um, erstwhile aspiring writer. She kind of gave up on her writing career. Anyway, one night she comes home early from a trip uh, to California. She thinks her husband is at a um, large fundraiser for her campaign, but as she soon finds out, he is not. Coming home early is never advisable. That's, that's, that's the lesson here, but you'll see what happens. Um, Sorry. Um, okay. By the time the taxi turned onto her street, Kathleen had started picturing where she'd be in a matter of minutes. Sitting on the three season porch in a fresh change of clothes, she imagined some loose, breezy ensemble that she didn't actually own. Having a glass of white wine, catching up on her New Yorkers, ignoring the dog. Instead, she came home to smoke billowing out of the garage. That doesn't look so good, the taxi driver said. Kathleen bolted out of the car. The driver was close behind her. Is anybody in the house? He asked. No, I mean, yes, Nugget, shit. Nugget, shit? Nugget, our dog, said Kathleen, he's in there. She started toward the house, but the driver flung his arm in front of her chest. Don't you go in there, ma'am. You call 911. I'll go get your dog. My twin brother's a firefighter. What's that got to do with? You want your dog to die of smoke inhalation? What does he look like? He looks like a dog, said Kathleen. He's the only one in there. The house doesn't look like it's on fire. I can really just, big dog, small dog, a Yorkshire Terrier, small with a missing eye, but small one-eyed dog with a missing eye. Got it, give me your keys. She handed him the keys just to get rid of him and called 911. When she got off the phone with the dispatcher, she moved a few paces over the lawn toward the garage. The smoke was thicker than it had been seconds before and there were now tendrils of flame creeping out from under the roof. The left-hand garage door was open and Kathleen saw that the source of the blaze was Bill's 1969 Dodge Charger, which he'd bought on a whim the year before. It was completely engulfed in flames. In spite of herself, Kathleen felt a flare of triumph. She told him repeatedly that it was a death trap. She'd been referring to its lack of three-point seatbelts and airbags, but the fact that it was now on fire was not altogether surprising to her. Still, poor Bill was going to be heartbroken. 
She dialed his number and was waiting for him to pick up when suddenly there he was, emerging from the garage, stumbling and coughing, a spent fire extinguisher in his hands, wearing nothing but a half unbuttoned white dress shirt and boxer shorts. Bill, Jesus. She ran toward him. What's happening? Are you okay? He staggered forward a few more steps, then tossed the fire extinguisher aside, fell to his hands and knees, hacking and coughing, and vomited onto the grass. Kathleen knelt beside him and rubbed his back. After a few final mucus-drenched coughs, he looked at her. I'm sorry, Kath, he croaked. Sorry for what? What happened? In the distance, there was the wail of sirens. Shit, Bill said and commenced coughing again. I got him, all good. The taxi driver was coming down the front walk, nugget a small hairy lump in his arms. Hey, he pointed to Bill. You're that guy running for president. I saw you on the news. Senate, Bill managed to gasp. The driver grinned. Sure, that's where it starts. He handed Nugget to Kathleen, nearly knocking her to the ground, then pulled his phone out of his pocket and crouched next to Bill to snap a selfie. Delete that, Bill yelled, his voice suddenly strong and clear. Don't worry, the driver said, standing back up. I won't show it to anyone, just my wife. Please delete, Bill said, before he was racked by another coughing fit. An ambulance and a fire engine were pulling into the driveway now. All right, all right. The driver tapped at his phone in a not entirely convincing way. I guess you being in your underwear and everything. For the first time, it occurred to Kathleen to wonder, why was Bill in his underwear? Bill, she said, why are you, were you in the middle of getting dressed? In the car? He turned his head toward her and the look in his eyes was one of utter defeat. I'm so sorry, Kath, he rasped. She's not, she just... Kathleen felt the blood drain from her limbs. Please let him be referring to the car, she thought. But Bill was not the kind of man who referred to cars or boats or any other mode of transportation as she. She wouldn't have married him if he were. He started coughing again, and this time it sounded decidedly fake. Kathleen stood and turned slowly around. Atop the low wall on the other side of the driveway was a woman in a disheveled blue cocktail dress, barefoot, slumped over on her side, her face partially obscured by the low-hanging branches of her rhododendron. A pair of hot pink panties dangled from her left ankle. Sorry. Uh-oh, said the driver. Who is? Kathleen could barely force the words from her throat. That. Bill did not reply. Is she dead? The driver eventually said. She drank too much, said Bill. I don't know, said the driver. She looks pretty dead. Excuse me, Kathleen said, a scrap of breath having returned to her throat, her lungs. Could you give us some space, please? She turned and thrust Nugget into the driver's arms. Keep him if you want. Now, I'm not really a dog person and the missing eye thing. You can't keep him, Bill said. Just go away. The driver shrugged and ambled down the lawn. Who is that? Kathleen asked Bill again. She couldn't bring herself to say she. It would confirm the fact that there was indeed a she in their yard, a she in their life. But before Bill could answer or take his fake coughing up a notch, two AMTs appeared, one man and one woman, and clapped an oxygen mask to his face. Kathleen turned away. Across the driver driveway, the that in the dress was also being attended to by an EMT. Kathleen recognized her now, one of a bevy of 20-something women who worked on Bill's campaign. If he was going to do this, did he have to be such a goddamn cliche about it? She felt the sudden violent urge to be as far from his, as him as possible. I'm going to get Nugget. She started down the lawn to where the taxi driver was holding up Nugget's paw, making him wave at a cell phone camera held by a neighbor. She hadn't gotten more than a few steps when a female EMT caught up to her. Hey, ma'am, the EMT said softly. She touched her palm to Kathleen's shoulder, and for a second, Kathleen thought perhaps she was going to try to comfort her. It's okay, I'm fine, Kathleen said, though in fact she was suddenly on the edge of tears, just from that gentle touch. Would it be strange if she hugged the EMT? Yes, it would. You just had a little, um, leak, the EMT said. She shrugged off her jacket and tied it around Kathleen's waist. A leak? The fire chief will want to give the all clear before he lets you into the house, but I think you could sneak around the back door and change if you wanted. I'll cover for you. What do you, 
You're clear. She turned Kathleen toward the house and gave her a little shove. Go! It wasn't until she was rounding the back corner of the house that Kathleen realized with a growing sense of dread what had probably happened. In her haste to get home after her flight landed, she hadn't stopped to use the bathroom at JFK. And therefore, she hadn't changed the tampon she'd been wearing since she left LA. The weird, flimsy, organic hemp made by women in Malawi tampon she'd had to borrow from her sister when her period showed up four days early with a vengeance, the way it so often did at of late. Except, of course, when it didn't show up at all. What a joy it was to be 47. Inside the house, she flung off the EMT's jacket and raced to the bathroom off the kitchen where she climbed up onto the toilet and peered over her shoulder to see herself in the mirror. And there it was. On the very bottom of the seat of her pale green capris was a circle of dark, ugly blood the size of a saucer. She sat down on the toilet and sobbed. Thank you. What a, what a beginning of a novel. <laughs> yeah, it starts with a bang and a... Yeah, and a stain. <laughs> so what, what happens from there, I'll just quickly say, is that it turns out that the taxi driver took a picture that encompassed the scene with, you can see Bill in his underwear, you can see his mistress passed out, and you can see the big stain on the back of Kathleen's pants, and the photo goes viral, of course. And of course, what everyone's fixated on, more than the infidelity by this politician, is the stain on her pants. And um she ends up becoming sort of the unwitting um, poster child figurehead for a movement uh, for menstrual justice and destigmatization called hashtag Yes We Bleed. <laughs> so, uh, when you are you've been everywhere with this book, do you like doing readings? Do you like touring around? I do. Yeah, I really like it. It's yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm enjoying it, especially it's a, it's a great way to see people I haven't seen in a long time. So. Now, one thing I know about you, like you are a very funny person. You use satire and sarcasm a lot. So in this book is obviously satire. So uh, do you feel that satire shows the most intelligence of any sort of humor? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know, I, I think it's, I think it has a purpose, right? I mean, satire is, is a way of, is commentary on, usually contemporary events and, and mores and, and um, you know, often it's political and cultural. So for that satire, it, you know, it, it has to be intelligent. It has to be cutting and it has to reveal things. Um, but I don't know. I, I think, I think all kinds of humor can, can be intelligent when, when done properly. I mean, I think even the most silly and slapstick stuff can be brilliant. Yeah. I mean, satire is a great loophole. You can say anything almost if it's satire, now, is it easier to write in that way, like to hold the characters, or uh, is it easier to write straight, like you did in Eden Lake? Um, well, I don't know. I don't know about easier. I, I, it's certainly more fun for me to write satirically. Um, I, I so I, I think in a way, I, I guess I would say in a way, it's easier because I, I feel like I'm able to give them more. Um, make them more interesting characters and make the scenes livelier and the energy of the book better more easily than I am with writing straight kind of stuff. And I think, um, yeah, I, I think I was kind of holding myself back when I was writing more straight ahead, serious fiction like Eden Lake and other things I attempted to get published. Um, when you were writing the character of Bill, did any... Was there a real figure, a real politician that jumped into your head as you were writing? You know, there there wasn't really a single person. Um, I, I had a little bit of like John Edwards in mind, right? He was this sort of, you know, liberal, you know, kind of charming America's dad kind of kind of guy who ended up, you know, having been cheating on his wife while she was going through cancer treatment. Um, and I think that surprised a lot of people. Um, but I don't know, there's so many cheating politicians to draw from. <laughs> it's just like, it's just a, you know, a type. So I was able to create my version of that type. Uh, Robert Fleming asked, since America is now politically correct, what impact did a satire have in finding a publisher? 
Well, I, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know that America as a whole is politically correct or whatever that means. Um, I mean, certainly people are more careful about, you know, offending folks. Um, so satire had to, I, I think there, there may have been some publishers who were afraid of um, some of the things I was poking fun at in this, in this book. Uh, but I really don't show any mercy to anyone. Uh, well, that's maybe not true. I, I show less mercy to, <laughs> to more mercy to some groups than other groups. But, you know, what I really wanted to poke at here was both um, the way that so-called political correctness can become ridiculous, but also the ways that um, criticizing it can become ridiculous, right? It, you know, we're we're learning as a society to be more respectful of folks from a wider swath of, of cultures and, and sexuality, ability, all this kind of stuff. So, you know, on the one hand, those changing standards are, are good and important. What, where it gets to be trickier is, is things are changing so fast. So if anyone makes a false move and then they're promptly pilloried for it, you know, it doesn't give people a lot of chance. So much happens so quickly and is so knee jerk online. And I wanted to hold a mirror up to that and uh, get folks thinking about it. Yeah, you're saying there might be some discomfort by a publisher. Did you run into any discomfort when you were doing readings at all? Um, I haven't yet. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, the thing with, with the satire is it, it like, and satire and, and I think like comedy in general is it push, it, it goes right to the edge of discomfort. You know, I think like the best and funniest stuff will, it, it reveals something that we're all a little bit uncomfortable with. Um, and people have to be willing to sit in that place of discomfort. So um, I, I haven't gotten any pushback yet that I'm aware of but it may be coming. I, there was actually, I should say, there was one publisher that sort of didn't, it was like they didn't get, <laughs> they didn't get it. Like they didn't get the satire. They're like, oh, you can't make light of, you know, these serious issues. I was like, well, but that's what satire is. It's like my making light of them is underlining their seriousness. Like I'm trying to emphasize that, you know, through contrast and and through relief. I mean, you know, that that's like we're talking about catch 22. I mean, it would be like if someone said, oh, you can't you can't make fun of war. War is really bad. It's like, yeah, no kidding. War is bad. That's why we're writing like a cutting satire about it and, and about its absurdity. We're shining a light on that. Um, yeah. Do uh, I think a lot of people in society don't realize um, how like social media works in a way like you're saying and things go viral that almost seems to be the goal versus the content. Yeah, for a lot of things, definitely. It seems like, I mean, certainly when you look at stuff like, um, you know, TikTok and, and videos, there does seem to be the goal of, of going viral. And, you know, so what happens in the book, and, and um, I didn't mention this before, but there's a group that Kathleen, the heroine, becomes a part of called the Society of Shame, made up of folks who have gotten internet famous, who have been shamed online, who have been canceled, who have been um, caught in a bad moment, or, you know, there's one woman, when, one woman who's been made into a GIF. Um, so these are folks who weren't trying to get internet famous, but did. And that seems like it can happen just as e easily, right? I mean, there's really no, there's no scientific way to determine what's going to go viral and what's not. I mean, if, if there were an easy way, people would be using it all the time, but there's no guarantee. Yeah, the the image that you, uh, the images that come up are so sharp in what you just read. So I'm wondering, did that, were you stricken by an image when you wrote that section or was it the other way around? Was it plot driven that you went to the imagery of the fire and the the affair and the, the leak? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the origin story, of the book really is around that first scene. And I had um, I had seen a story going around online. So I knew I wanted to write something about internet shaming or internet fame. And I happened to see a story online about a guy who came home and found his wife and her lover dead of carbon monoxide 
poisoning in the garage after fooling around in the in the car while it was idling and that got me thinking like oh my god what a horrible well, first of all what a horrible thing but then what a horrible thing to have be public like that not only is it public that your wife was cheating on you but like in this horrible lurid sort of crazy way so I was thinking, okay, maybe I can have a scenario sort of like that. And then I was like, okay, how can I make it even more humiliating? So I was like, oh, she could get her period in the middle of it and have everyone see it. Like, so that all just kind of came to, and then it was fortuitous that, that that also ended up being a launching pad to, okay, well, that could make her famous. Like that could turn into something, something bigger. Now with all the extreme conservatives out there, if this story was true that you wrote, would that story be canned? Uh, what you mean the uh, like the, story right, about... thinking, yeah, the Christian right? Would a real news story about a woman that something like that happens to would it would it be canned or do you think it would be gone with? Like would would this news story be banned? Well, I mean. I don't know. I mean, I think it would get out regardless, just through, you know, the way social media happens and, you know, the way things go viral. Um, certainly there would be probably more people trying to shut it, maybe people trying to shut it down. I mean, I did try to show in the book some of the bad, whereas you have folks primarily on the left who are like, yes, go, go Kathleen, you know, empowered, like own it. Um, there certainly is some depiction of the backlash from conservatives who are saying, oh, this is this is gross. This is terrible. Why are we making a big deal of this? Um, and I had a little fun with the idea of um, men. There's a scene in the book where uh, so they're the, these little interstitials that show transcripts and blog posts and, and things. And there's one that's a talk show and three men are discussing the whole yes we bleed movement um and talking about like well men bleed too all blood matters you know why what's the big deal so i kind of had fun um playing around with that and that's obviously like a commentary on other things so um do you ever worry that books such as this will get on a banned list and would you consider it an <laughs> honor if the society of shamed made a banned list oh absolutely yeah I would I would be very honored to be to be banned because uh, you know I mean there are there are some books about I don't know if there's a lot of books dealing with like menstruation that are getting banned I know like Are You There God It's Me Margaret has been famously banned many times and that deals with puberty and menstruation and um, so you know I, I mean the the sad thing is like I think getting banned actually benefits book sales, <laughs> but that it doesn't mean it's something anybody wants, you know, it's like, um, I mean, it really is kind of ridiculous what's happening right now. It's the, the next step is there's no book for sales, you know? Yeah, right, right. That's yeah. the scary part. So you have two kids, a uh, husband that's a musician. Um, when do you have your writing time? Um, well, I tried, I also have a day job. Um, so I, I try to write first thing in the morning before I have to switch gears and, and do my day job. I'm a freelance copywriter and brand strategist. So I'll try to do that first thing. And then sometimes I'll, I'll periodically try to get away on little, little self-imposed writing retreats where I'll, you know, rent an Airbnb and go off by myself or with a couple of friends. Um, but yeah, just sneaking it in. Have you ever been on a roll that you've not reported to your job? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the nice thing about being self-employed is like, I don't have to report anywhere. <laughs> I'm my own boss. So yeah, there may have been times where I, I missed a deadline, um, you know, and I made up some good excuse for it. Sometimes, you know, when I will go away to write, I'll be like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm in meetings all day. I'm on meetings all day, Thursday and Friday. So I'm not going to be able to respond. And it makes you sound really busy and important to your clients when really you're just working on your writing. Yeah. I also found your memoir to be quite amazing. Um, what, what you revealed in your memoir, was that difficult to put out there? I, I know that you had a, you had a blog, which kind of um, was out there as well in terms of that information, but like, what was how like when it came out in the world in book form? Did you have any emotions around that? 
Yeah, I mean, what yeah, what you're referring to is I, I write about sort of the severe depression that I was going through, um, and I had had experience with depression, clinical depression in the past, but it got much worse um, about a year after my kids were born, um, and when when I weaned them specifically, which I think is something that doesn't get talked enough. Uh, about enough. People talk about postpartum, but there's actually post weaning depression as well. When you think about it, it makes sense with the hormonal shifts. Um, but you know, I, it, it was a little uh, scary to put that stuff out there, but like you said, I'd been blogging about it. So, and I knew from doing that, I'd gotten so many responses from people, readers saying, thank you. Thank you so much for writing about this. And thank you for being honest about it. And it made me realize I need help or, so I guess I I felt like okay well it is it was it was strange knowing like coworkers and certain folks would be reading it um, but I guess I felt like it was it was worth it on the balance. Okay, Robert's asking about the readership by gender. Is there any way to to know your readership and how the split mm. is in the Society of Shame? Yeah, I mean. I don't, I don't really know for sure. I mean, most fiction, the vast majority of, of fiction readers and buyers in the country right now are female um, for whatever reason. I think it's different by genre. I, you know, I think there may be a higher percentage of men in like mystery um, and fantasy and sci-fi, but for, you know, for literary fiction, for commercial fiction, for, I don't know, a market, what women's, I don't, I don't even know what the hell mine is, but <laughs> it tends to be more women. Um, but you know, the menstruation, the, the period aspect isn't really, I mean, it is, it's central to the book, but it's also, it's like a vehicle in a way, yeah, right? So like the, it, it, it could have been around a, a different, well, no, that's not necessarily true. I should walk that back anyway, but men who have read it <laughs> have told me they really enjoyed it. Um, because it's, you know, more than anything, it's, it's, it's common, you know, it's social commentary and it's there. And there is a, there is a story of, of a person's, you know, who happens to be a middle-aged woman, her sort of second coming of age and figuring out what she wants to do. Cause as we all know, like you, you hit midlife and you know, you're around 50 and you, you know, it's, it's normal for men and women to start sort of reassessing and figuring out, am I doing what I want to be doing? Is this where I want to be? So, you know, that's, that's a big part of the story as well. Um, but yeah, I love hearing that men read it and like it, and um, maybe they learn something too when it comes to the the menstruation part of it. Oh, uh, I knew somebody from uh, my writing group whose father did something famously viral before the internet. Oh yeah, so, and I know that you also uh, you did. So would you ever consider doing a podcast and having people on that have been affected by viral campaigns like you were talking about and or real news stories? Well, I, I think there is one there. Um, there was a show. Uh, I feel like maybe it was a TV, thing, like a Netflix hosted by Monica Lewinsky about people who had it was called like 15 minutes or, so, or something about people who had been affected in this way. And, and there's another podcast as well um up called um it's like getting beyond shame and i think it's hosted by someone someone who is sh shamed online in some way so the need is being fulfilled <laughs> yeah yeah monica lewinsky the i follow her on twitter what an, what an amazing woman like it's... yeah yeah yep um, it's really fascinating i yeah she's she's fascinating and i think how differently i see and think about that whole situation now than I did when I, as a like young person, her age, almost her age, when it happened, I was, I guess I was a little older than her, but I see it, see it very differently now. And also as a mother, I see it very differently when I've got 16 year olds who, you know, four or five years younger than she was at the time. Now, is there some of that same bounce back in Kathleen's story in your book? bounce back in terms of, uh, in terms of being shamed as she reached this oh. status of, you know, a higher status. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about, I mean, I don't want to give too much away. It's sort of like she, she starts out feeling ashamed about what's happening, but then she sort of reclaims it, but then she quickly realizes that how fickle 
social media and the internet and the public at large are. So she's trying to like keep one step ahead of staying in people's favor. So she sort of goes up and down and up and down and she's loved and she's hated and she's loved and she's hated. Um, and ultimately she needs to decide um, and she, she does decide how she's going to um, just, just reckon with it and say, do I want to be a part of this or not? And if I want to be a part of it, how am I going to do it while retaining some control um, and sense of self? Um, so. Jane, thank you for spending time with us. This was thank what you. I was really going to post uh, your bio at the lib, the lit hub site. And uh, ah, yes. you want to know more about Jane? Uh, check her out on the internet. It's a really safe place, that internet based on what you're talking about. <laughs> and uh, definitely, definitely, definitely check out Society of Shame. So, thank you so much, Tim. Such it was a awesome. Good book. Thank and, you, everyone. Uh, Folks that are watching on the stream, I know that you're out there. If you wrote some really thoughtful questions on that, I didn't get a chance to see them because I'm in here. So next time, come in here with us. Uh, you can come in here with us right now um, to do the open mic. If that's what you're interested in, I will let you in. Jane, thanks once again.